will be proceeding uh, uh, straight to the panel. And the subject under discussion is from policy to action. And we will be asking the question of how far we have come. Well, two questions really. How far we have come with gender emergence and how far we have left to go still. So without further ado, I'm going to ask the um, members of the panel to introduce themselves in short 30 second bursts. Uh, my name's Laura Manson Smith. I'm a partner in PwC's consulting practice. And I have spent most of the last 17 years working with clients in oil and gas and mining and um, utilities. Um, I know that for many chief executives in this sector across the globe, one of the key risks that they see is there aren't simply enough talented people out there to help them grow their businesses. Not enough scientists, engineers, and technology people in particular. And I, I truly believe that the companies that are going to be really successful in our sector are those who really promote women into positions of leadership in all types of um, functions and disciplines within the sector. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. You wonder. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Yewande Sadiku. I work for Stambik IBTC Capital. I'm responsible for the Stambik IBTC Group's investment banking business in Nigeria. And we advise clients on mergers, acquisitions, corporate restructurings, um, debt and equity raising, and um, long term finance for companies in various sectors oil and gas, telecoms, and the like. Um, I've been with the group for 18 years now, and I've worked on you know, several landmark transactions. We only recently, about two months ago, um, completed the largest IPO in Nigeria, as it happens, of an oil and gas company that emerged from the government's indigenization program. I also happen to have a personal um, interest in Nigeria's um, emerging creative industries. And my executive produced a film, Half of a Yellow Sun, based on a very popular, well-respected book by Nigeria's Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, it's the largest production to have been funded out of Nigeria. The bulk of the funding came from Nigeria. And I hope it is you know, one of many firsts you know, that will emerge for, for Nigeria's creative industries. I look forward to chatting with you about my very strong views about the position of women in suits. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Can everybody here at the back? Because I get the sense that the, it's not carrying. Okay, let's, let's move right on. Okay, my name's Jenny Patterson. Good afternoon. I'm uh, towards the twilight of my career. Um, so hopefully I'll bring a bit of ageism to this discussion. Um, I spent my whole career in the investment management business. So I've traveled the globe raising assets for us to manage from countries as far afield as Saudi Arabia, which was quite a challenge, which I'm very happy to tell you about, to Tokyo, to Singapore, Australia, Canada, etc. I've always been uh, passionate about trying to encourage women um, who've been in the teams working for me and to be a good role model and to give them the encouragement and self-belief to really push themselves forward. Um, you know, in, I come from the UK, and I might like to add a bit of controversy here that perhaps our only female prime minister didn't do quite as much for other women as she might have. But, you know, we can discuss that further, hopefully. Good afternoon, Honourable Minister, Mrs. Jemmy Day, um, Engineer uh, Ernest Lawapa, the CEO and Executive uh, Secretary of the NCDMB. My name is Dr. Amy Jadassini. I'm the Managing Director of LADOL, which is the only 100% indigenous Nigerian deep offshore logistics space. Um, we took an empty piece of land and over a period of five years, we turned it into a $500 million deep offshore base, which has a 200 meter key wall, warehouses, workshops, it also has a hotel and offices. So it's a fully functioning integrated facility. And um, it was only possible for us to achieve this goal, I would say, because of the enabling environment created by the Honorable Minister and the NCDMB. So 
Um, what we've embarked on now is actually our phase two, and we are raising a $500 million new fund to expand our facility. And again, I would say that the Local Content Act, the indigenization of the oil and gas and maritime sector have been instrumental in our initial success and in giving us the confidence to go forward and in giving our international partners the confidence to go forward with us. So that, <laughs> so that is some, so what you do represents some of the big thinking uh, that's taking place around gender emergence. But I want to, to start at a more basic and general level with you here one day. Where is gender emergence today? As we are in the middle of 2014, are you satisfied with where, where we are today? Um, for many people, when they think of gender emergence, um, providing facilities for women to demonstrate what they're capable of, it normally starts with a microfinance mentality. So let's give them lots of small loans, 50,000 Naira, 100,000 Naira, so they can run small businesses and feed their families. But most of us, as you can tell in this room, are a lot more ambitious you know, than small SME businesses. Um, and I think you know, that, that there are many realities women face. One is biology. You know, you're going to have the child, and you're going to have to deal you know, with the biological need to care for that child and nurture your family. But in the workplace, um, I mean, I started off assuming that I didn't want to be cut any slack because I was a woman. Because going through nursery, primary, secondary, university, in reality, in those phases of your life, genders are equal in most societies. Um, nobody cares in class whether it's a boy or a girl you know, that has the best result. Teachers push children to achieve their best. It's when they get into university, sorry, it's when they start working, when they start having families, that the imbalance starts. I believe very strongly you know, that the glass ceiling exists, but I also don't believe that it was necessarily put there by somebody else. I think sometimes women create that glass ceiling. And many female executives, as they rise in their um, positions and find that they're spending a lot more time at work and a lot less at home, you know, question what is important to them. I know that I'm dealing with that now. And I wonder, you know, whether this is what I want my life to be, about work rather than about my children and my family. But in society, as in life, you know, there are many shades of us. Um, it, same thing with sexes, color, shape, you know, height and the like. And government has to actively, actively, promote a balance in gender representation to ensure that we're building societies that are properly balanced. We're going to come on to the policy in a moment. I don't want to cut you short. I'm just going to ask for snappy answers from the panel so that we can get everybody in and get the interaction, uh, the interactivity from, from the audience. But I want to come to Laura. Mm -hmm. you've, you've been doing some studies around this. Yes. Well, what have you found? Well, could I just pick up on one, one point that um, you mentioned? I, I think actually um, stereotypes and bias start very early, and I think um, girls, you know, very, very young at school can experience that. Um, outside of work, one of the things I do is I'm a chair of governors for two city schools in London, and when I go in and talk to the girls who, you know, are eight, nine, ten, and I ask them which subjects they enjoy, already some of them start to tell me, well, not maths, because girls aren't good at maths, are they? and not sciences, and I, I try and persuade them otherwise. So I think it's really important that we, we encourage girls at school to study the sorts of subjects that will help them get to the top jobs in, in the um, oil and gas industry. And so it's great to see some um, students here, and I'd encourage you to work in the sector because it's great fun. Um, but the report, you want me to just summarise it? So one of the things I did recently with, um, with a, a fellow partner at PwC was do some research to really check how diverse, from a gender perspective, are the boards of the, the major um, oil and gas companies, listed companies. And we looked at the top 100. And I'm afraid the, the answer is not very diverse at all. But I have to admit that you know, even I was surprised at how um, low the percentage of female directors is on the top 100. So Give us a number. Um, 11%. 
11%. So, um, so that's really concerning to me. And then if you look at the, the, the roles that those um, directors are performing, most of them are in non-executive positions. Um, and only 1% um, only of the um, executive board seats are held by women in those top 100 companies. So, and I, perhaps I'll give you one more number and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. And the other thing is we've heard about 30% today, and I think that's really important because we know that if a minority group has a 30% of the voice, it's more likely to have an impact. And I'm afraid only 6% of those companies had that 30% um, of, of female directors. So there's a lot to do with my answer. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, Wanda made the, 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 the point very powerfully. J do jump in, do weigh in. Yeah, there was one thing I wanted to just add to that. There was a study, I'm sorry, Laura, that McKinsey did <laughs> in 2012, which just shows what nonsense it is because they did this study and they took the top quartile in terms of companies with exposure to women on boards, compared them with those that had no women on their boards, mm -hmm. and on financial measures, which obviously as an investment manager we would always look at, the companies in the top quartile performed exceptionally better. 53% increase in EBIT and 41% increase on return on equity. So financially, it makes sense. You know, it's not just about giving people an opportunity. The companies are better. There was also a couple of uh, professors in Harvard did some work, and they said they, what they showed is that if you have a group of people, a group of men on their own, and you just take the collective intelligence of them, it doesn't really relate necessarily to the individual IQs per se. If you, in, if you add some women, it increases the collective intelligence of the group. But we knew that, right? <laughs> well, I just wanted to prove it. <laughs> so that was, done in, that was done by a couple of professors from Harvard in 2011. I thought that was fascinating. I don't, I don't think we needed a study to demonstrate that. But I want to pivot slightly to the, to the, to, to, to the big ticket items. You made the point very passionately uh, here one day about uh, financing being available for SMEs. And the sort of work that you do, Amy, is, is, is thinking big. For a big thinking young woman from Nigeria out there, how might she um, achieve her dreams of, 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 of scaling, of going really big in terms of becoming involved in business? Um, first, I'd like to make a general point that I think links the two topics. I think the youth of today have a huge advantage, particularly growing up in Nigeria, because a big issue in fundraising is perception. So when it comes to the concept of having women in leadership positions, I think Nigeria is actually ahead of the game. All of these studies are done you know, based on the West, and you don't see so much in Nigeria, but you know, we have a female honorable minister of petroleum, but it's not just that it's you know, women in, in, in power, it's women who are feminine, women who are intelligent, women, you know, when we were growing up, we had Margaret Thatcher, who, as you pointed out, didn't necessarily represent, you know, women didn't feel like they could aspire to be that. <laughs> so first of all, we have, we've created, I think, in Nigeria, an environment where our youth today are growing up, taking it for granted that, of course, a woman can, you know, reach the highest um, levels in society. It's similar with fundraising. So the biggest problem we had in Ladol in the beginning was negative perception. Nobody had done what we'd done before. In fact, across the whole of West Africa is Greenfield. So my biggest issue with fundraising is I'd go and see, you know, I used to work in banking outside of Nigeria, so I'd go and see international banks, and they'd say, look, if you were doing this in America, I'd give you the money tomorrow, at, you know, 2% interest. But for Nigeria, forget about it. So initially, we just had equity. And then there was really um, a complete sea change when um, the Local Content Act was passed. Because in order to do what we do, you have to raise large amounts of money over a long period of time based on a market case. And security isn't enough. Just to say, even if you have $100 million sitting in the bank, and you're going to give that to another bank as security, they still won't lend you the money 
because they want to know how you're going to pay them back, where your revenue is going to come from. So when the Local Content Act was passed, you then had this very compelling market case which said this 300 billion that Nigeria spent over the past 20 years outside of the continent is now going to be spent in Nigeria. And guess what? Over the next five to 10 years across West Africa, there's going to be you know, anything from 500 to a trillion dollars spent. And Nigeria is ideally placed to be the hub for that activity. So going forward, I think um, the Local Content Act has given us a platform. The natural growth in the market has given us the, um, the market fundamentals. Um, and I think those two things together have made it a lot easier to raise funds going forward. Now, as a woman, it's a slightly different proposition. To be honest with you, I think people trust women more. <laughs> so so if, you, if you put your you know, portfolio together and you're professional, um, and you obviously know what you're talking about, and you have a good team around you, I think as a woman, you may have an advantage in, in certain aspects of business. So there are two positives. The IQ is demonstrably raised, <laughs> as is the trust factor. So we, we have two very important, tangible things to work on. A quick question before I throw it out um, very quickly to the audience, and, I, I, and I'd like the, uh, the floor manager to give me an indication as to how um, much time um, I have left. Let's pivot to policy. We've had the 30% initiatives and some governments demonstrating a commitment to uh, making that 30% a reality. Mm -hmm. What more needs to be done in terms of policy to get where we need to and want to get to? I, um, I'm not a big supporter of government getting into business. I think business should be run by the private sector. But I think there's certain guidelines that government needs to set in reality, the transfer of assets in the oil and gas sector to Nigerians' hands would never have happened if there wasn't a local content policy. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same way. If you want gender balance, there needs to be legislation, there needs to be... I'm serious. The countries that have done it successfully, in Norway and in Canada, legislated that a certain number of people in companies on board, and I don't mean in a non-executive capacity, mm. must be women. Yeah. But we must realize that women themselves set a glass ceiling mm. because of the reality of who they are. So we almost, even in, 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 in corporate organizations, we have to help women realize that they can eat their cake and have it. They just can't eat all and have all. That is a very controversial concept. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to ask, um, um, I'm going to ask very quickly, how do women raise money for, for the big ticket items, the large turnover sectors? Well, I mean, I think it goes back to what Amy was saying now. It's all about being professional, having your proposal watertight, but being 100% confident in your product, being fearless. Um, going to the organizations and not being daunted, not thinking, oh, they're not going to take me seriously because I'm a woman or my product. And one of the things which I think will, in the longer term, be very beneficial to Nigeria is, be, is this new Mint uh, or, uh, series of company, countries. Excuse me. If you think about the transformatory effect that had on the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, the second wave of mint, it's, there isn't an index yet, but believe me, as soon as there is, then, and people start being forced, and I mean forced, investment managers will have to have exposure to the mint countries because their underlying investors will require it the amount of capital available will be transformatory. For people who are not familiar with the Sorry. term, any, anyone not familiar with the term Mint? India, Nigeria, and Turkey are in there. What's the other country? No, Mint is Mexico, India. Indonesia. 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 India is a BRIC country. Yeah, Nigeria and Turkey. BRIC was Brazil, Russia, India, China. Okay. And that's another thing you need to avoid, which is what I've just jumped right into is, yeah. is using jargon. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to make sure that it was yeah, clear sorry. to everyone. Laura, we haven't heard from you in a while. Is the, is the policy prescription changing things, ripping up the script? Is it 
to it, does it fall to the governments or the corporations? I think it's I think it's both actually, and I think this is an area where collaboration is really important. I think on the subject of targets and quotas, I think you have to beware unintended consequences, and mm. I think. In some ways, Norway, um, to pick up on your example, has done brilliantly. So, 42% of of its um, in, its directors in the in the in the um, section we looked at are are women. However, um, you could argue that it's had a knock-on effect on the proportion of women on the management committee below that, which is effectively the pipeline. And that's only, if I if I recall, I think six six percent of are females. So, that's obviously had you know mm. potential impact there. I, um, there's a wonderful piece of research by the World Economic Forum which looks at um, gender gap. And it looks at four different areas. It looks at education, it looks at economic participation, health and political empowerment. And um, it shows real clear correlation between, between those countries which have closed the gap in all of those areas and GDP per head and competitiveness. And so I guess um, when I was looking at the data around Nigeria um, before today, um, Nigeria is really closing the gap um, around political empowerment, which is which is fantastic, and um, uh, participation of women in the workforce. But the, the two areas of focus um, will be around um, education and health. That's a good note on which to throw things out to the audience. I've got uh, I've got time for a couple of quick questions, and I recognise you, ma'am. Don't look around. You, please. Do you have a mic? Um, right, if I could be slightly provocative to the panel and then hopefully get a response from you. Um, Please be quick in your question. Okay, do you actually really think that policy on its own is sufficient to actually trigger a change or do we need to have an organic movement and then policy complement that? So in the case of the Local Content Act in Nigeria, I think the only reason why it's been successful is because we had an industry that's been on operation for 50 years. I've seen this happen in Ghana where a Local Content Act has been passed only... Uh, maybe four years into the industry actually developing, and yet it's actually stifling growth in the industry. So, I mean, what's your view on, on, on that um, issue? We're going to take a couple more questions in a cluster, and that's it. We'll finish. Can you pass the microphone to this gentleman in the gray suit, please? Your question very quickly. Yeah. I, I, thank you very much. I agree with most of the panelists' conclusion. But, however, I think we, are, we have to look at some of these issues from the other perspective, especially in the area of education. Uh, policy is good. Provided finance is okay. But if we, dis if we fail to look at the educational aspects, whereby we have a lot of disparity between the male education and the female education, we are not going to get there. And at the end of the day, we also need to look at the courses ladies and women are studying in schools. There is a myth in Nigeria that says that um, engineering, education, technical education are not meant for ladies. They are only meant for men. So we have to look at it from that angle too. And the other one, the other thing you I need have, to... You don't have another one, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> one more question very quickly. Who wants it? Nobody? I will throw to the panel to answer those two questions I, in the order in which they were oh, asked. Oh, I was going to do it in reverse. I think okay, that, if you wish. I think that the education thing, which people, we've all touched on before, is very important. But the other thing, too, is the jobs that women, as a result, are encouraged to go into and, therefore, the positions they have on boards. So when I was working for a large investment company, you know, it's no surprise. The other woman on the board was the HR director, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think we need to encourage people, encourage women to take, have a broader skill set and also to take a broader look at what jobs they can, they can actually hold down. It goes back to what Lauren was saying about, you know, maths isn't for girls. Yeah, it, it, it's always the HR, the head of HR. In, yeah. it, in, in, in the old days, it was the head of personnel. No. <laughs> yes. So, so, yes. Yeah. And, and, and the other question, who wants to take that? Um, okay. Um, uh, two quick things I'll, I'll touch on. I think, that, I think the two are related in a way. Um, infrastructure development and human capital development, I think, go hand in hand. So, similarly, having... Um, empowering policies in a country, so the Local Content Act in Nigeria, 
has only been successful because there's also been a wave of private indigenous investment in everything from vessels to engineering. We also have in our audience two um, women who are very distinguished, Engineer O'Keen and Mrs. Ujefo, um, who are also examples of this indigenous investment in moving forward. So Nigeria, I think, is unique because we have a very long history of oil and gas. But I think um, you can um, see in other sectors which are younger, telecommunications and banking, exactly the same thing happening because you have this very powerful, entrepreneurial, hardworking, indigenous population that are willing to move in and take advantage of those policies. Time for a couple of questions. Uh, and I'm going to give Yewande and Laura uh, chances, uh, opportunities to to field those questions. Can we have a couple more questions, please? Hi, again. Yeah. So, uh, talking about, I come from Mexico and we face a lot of the same stereotypes that you face in African countries. So, would it, would it be possible, for example, uh, thinking in, for example, London, or to start with policies that are not only directed to women, but to men as well, for example, demanding that paternity leave is equal to maternity leave. Something that, that from that side starts equaling the balance and it's not just focused on granting rights to women, but also so that it's not, we're not seen as the enemy always, but that it's also. So we're already, already starting to see a shift and, and again, that World Economic Forum report is a great source for different policies in different countries. Um, and we're seeing a, a shift towards paternity leave and so on. And, and you know, we're seeing in, in, some home, in some families, men are the, the primary carers of the children. So that's all starting to shift. Can I take it off policy a little bit? Sure. One of the things we haven't talked about is, 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 is development and training and development of women. And I just think it would be wrong if we missed that because we've talked about policy and we've talked about education. But one of the really big enablers is to make sure we've got really good development, mentoring and sponsorship for women of high potential in our organisations. And we have to involve the men in that process as well. Um, so, the yep. what do you do next? so I, one of the programs that I went on at PwC was a women's um, leadership program for people with partner potential. But the deal was that I had to attend that with a sponsoring male partner because um, half of the training was about um, helping me think about what kind of leader I wanted to be. But half of it was about raising his awareness about what it meant to be a female leader in our firm so that he could start to change his behaviors and influence for positive change. Your take, your one? Um, I mean, I agree that, I mean, when, when, I, when, I talk about, um, when I talk about ensuring through legislation or policy, you know, that there's a fair representation of women, I also think it'll be just as wrong to have an unfair, to have an unfair representation of men. So in the same way that there are companies that are completely driven by men with no women, I think it'd be just as wrong for society to develop in a way that women are the ones wearing the suits and men are sitting at home, because you need a balance of both. And their, their rights and their wrongs, you know, <laughs> we're protecting you a lot more than you would have done to us. <laughs> So, gentlemen, uh, t today has hopefully been an education for us. Uh, you, you add a, a high-powered woman to the mix, the intelligence quotient rises, the trust factor also rises, and um, it's, it, it's quite clear that if we're talking about gender emergence, we need the support of the men, whether it's in policy-making positions, in families, on boards, and all the rest of it. I'd like to thank uh, my distinguished panel for taking the time and sharing their particular insights with us. And in reverse chronological order, I'm going to ask you to cross your T's and dot your I's by having a quick final word on the subject that we've been discussing today, starting with you, Amy. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I think I'd just like to end on a positive note. We have seen huge changes happen across the world. We've seen bigger changes happen in Nigeria in the past decade for men and for women. And I think that as you look forward, as those of you who are students look forward over the next 10 years, 
You should set very high goals for yourself, stay focused on those goals, and rest secure in the knowledge that you are entering an environment which is an enabling one, and you have many examples ahead of you uh, that you can follow and that can guide you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree wholeheartedly with what Amy said. Being slightly older, the current environment, I you think... You keep saying that, but you can't <laughs> see it. <laughs> um, I think the current environment is much more encouraging than it was 10, 15 years ago. The City of London, where I've worked, was incredibly... was still very much the old boy network. But if you have the faith in yourself, if you have the determination, I think it's possible to do whatever you set your mind on as a woman. As I said in my introduction, I actually went to Saudi Arabia, wore a hijab, and pitched for business. It wasn't an enjoyable experience, but it taught me that, and it was an example I could give to my female colleagues, just go for it. Do your homework, do your preparation, and go for it. Um, while I believe very strongly in affirmative action, and I believe that uh, conscious intervention um, needs to happen for the number of women in business on boards and the like to increase, I don't think that all women necessarily need to put themselves under pressure to be in business. If a woman chooses, top of her class, five degrees, that she wants to sit at home and raise a family, you know, it is the right thing for her to do because somebody needs to raise that next generation. And the last word is yours, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this, is, this is a wonderful industry. Yeah. So I just want yeah. to say again to the, the students in the room, you know, go into the industry. It's fantastic. Um, we've heard the business case for diversity on, on, on boards and in, in our companies. And I think that's clear. Um, I would also say it's great fun working in diverse teams. The best fun I've had is when it's teams with people with different insights and you often get the best results. And on that note, uh, I'd like to thank you again. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, panel, for your time. And let's have a round of applause. For you.